Well, hello, happy Sunday. My name is Taylor Wilkerson. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Trinity New York alongside my wife, Kristen. And I'm just so thankful that you're joining us here today. Uh, man, I hope you're having a great Sunday, a great day. Maybe you're watching this on another day, but wherever you are, whenever you are, I want you to know that we love you. We're so thankful that you're with us here at Trinity New York. Uh, today's a, a fun day because we're actually starting a brand new series, a brand new collection of talks, where we are studying the book of Galatians. Uh, we're going to be taking the next, the rest of the summer, and we're going to be studying Galatians, Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. And we're going to be going verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And I would encourage you to lean in, to take notes, and to study Galatians for yourself. Our, all of our groups, as they're gathering uh, online and across the city, uh, they're going to be talking about and discussing Galatians also. So maybe you're interested in uh, and having conversations and, and taking it a little bit deeper. Don't do that by yourself. Do it in relationships. Do it in a group today. I think that it, it adds so much more value. God's word wasn't just written to, uh, to individuals. It was written to people. It's written to churches. It was written to communities of people. And God's word is always best interpreted in community. So I'd encourage you to get into a group as we're studying God's word as a church for the rest of the summer. Now we're going to be jumping into uh, Galatians chapter one today, and I don't want to take uh, too much time uh, as, as we jump right into it, but I'm going to open us up, Galatians chapter one, verse one, and we're going to read through it together. So reach for your Bible, open up your notes, let's read God's word together. It says this, it says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. So he just starts, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle, and I'm not sent by people. I am sent by God himself. And then he goes on, he says, this is a letter to the churches in Galatia. He, goes, he says this, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I love that. Today, as we are studying just these first few verses, that's where we're stopping. That's all we're gonna get into today. Verses one through five. This is where we're starting. It's Paul's introduction. And I wanna give us a brief introduction to the book of Galatians. And we're gonna look at Paul's introduction to the church of Galatia. And, and, and we're gonna see that really this book, that in the, this introduction, is showing us what Paul's motivations are in writing this letter. Uh, motivations are, 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 are huge in life. And I'm calling this sermon, When Motivations Are Right. Motivations can be wrong. Motivations can be right. How do you know when your motivations are right? That's what we're gonna talk about. When your motivations are right right, when your motivations are right. Let's pray. Let's ask God to be with us. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. God, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us uh, through your word, that we would get our motivations aligned with you. God, we're so thankful. God, would you speak to us? In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen and amen and amen. Uh, man, I am... Uh, I, I, I'm so thankful to be here today. You know, if you don't know me, um, I am, uh, I'm Taylor. I am a husband. Uh, I'm married to the wonderful Kristen Renee Wilkerson. Uh, and I have three amazing kids. Those kids, I, 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 my oldest is Nora. I have a son named Hudson and I have a daughter named Eva. And they are the byproduct of a loving marriage. They are the byproduct of, uh, of a lot of love between Kristen and I. But I gotta be honest, when I first met Kristen in college, when I first met her at a Cold Stone Creamery, have you ever been to a Cold Stone? At Cold Stone, they have three sizes. It's, it's like it, love it, gotta have it. It's small, medium, and large. When I saw my wife at Cold Stone, I said, like it, love it, gotta have it. Uh, when I met my wife at Cold Stone Creamery, I gotta be honest, I would never imagine I never, could have, I never could have thought, if I could have seen a movie reel, if I could have imagined what, what just seeing this girl at an ice cream store could have become, I would have never believed you that, that this beautiful girl would one day be my wife, one day be the mother of my children. I could have never imagined that I would be raising children, leading a church with this girl that I met 
in an ice cream shop. Because when I saw this girl, all I had was one motivation. That motivation was simply that she was beautiful and I ought to talk to her. I didn't have too many steps laid out after that. I didn't really have too much to, in my wheelhouse to really know what that could become. All I knew was one thing. She was pretty and I was single. I didn't, I didn't care if she was single. I was single. She was pretty. I ought to know her. Uh, I was motivated by that one simple fact. And that motivation caused me to act that motivation caused me to reach out. That motivation caused me to flirt with her. And uh, she flirted right back, even though she had a boyfriend. Just saying, just saying. Um, I, I, I was motivated and that motivation brought action. That motivation brought movement. And that motivation, I don't know how pure it was, but it did get it started. Uh, in this life, we we're all motivated by all sorts of things. We have motivations that are things like money. We have motivations for things like notoriety. We're motivated by things like popularity. Some of us are motivated by success or autonomy. Uh, there's a leadership book that actually talks about the fact that, that, that there are really just seven motivations for everybody. Uh, some of us are motivated by these things I've listed. Uh, what are you motivated by today? Why did you take the job that you've taken? Why, did you, why do you live in this city? What motivates you to keep going? Uh, what motivates you is what will sustain you. And I think it's so important today that each and every one of us checks our motives in our lives. Motivation is, is the root behind why we do what we do. The motivation is the thing that keeps us going. Our motivations, the thing we want, what is it that is motivating us today? I, I think it's so possible that you and I can have good intentions, but wrong motivations. I think it's so possible today that we can want to do the right things, but do them for the wrong reasons. And today, I, I want to take a moment and just talk about getting our motivations right, because our motivations will cause us to move. What motivates us moves us. And, 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 and that's what I want to look at today. You see, when we look at this chapter right here, when you see Paul's introduction, what is Paul's motivation for writing this book? What's his motivation? Why is he doing this? Well, take a look. Right here, verse one, first three words. Paul, an apostle. Paul, an apostle. I, I, I think that's really beautiful. And, and this isn't really a point, it's more of a side note. Paul's name used to be Saul. But when he gave his life to Jesus, he let go of his past identity and took on a new name. He decided, I'm no longer Saul, I am Paul. He used to be a Pharisee, now he was an apostle. He took on a new identity, a new name entirely. I love that because I think it's a reminder for us as Christians that when we give our life to Jesus, we take on an entire new identity in Christ. So Paul, he starts with this fresh identity, but that's not what I wanna talk about. He says, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. This is awesome. We're talking about motivation today. How do we know when our motivations are right? How do we know when our motivations are wrong? I wanna give us three things that I think are just simple indicators that Paul gives us right here for when we know our motivations are right. What was Paul's motivations? Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about it. I believe that our motivations are right. When our motivations are right, number one, you seek obedience, not opportunity. When your motivations are right, when you're a follower of Jesus, your motivations are aligned with God's will when you seek obedience, not just opportunity. Look what Paul says. He says, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle. And I wasn't sent here from men, nor was I sent here by a man. I was sent here by Jesus Christ and God the Father. I think this is so huge today because what Paul is saying is that I'm not doing what I'm doing because of an opportunity before me. 
I'm not doing what I'm doing because of an open door. I'm not doing what I'm doing because of what I feel like will benefit me. I am doing what I am doing because I believe that God has called me to do it. You see, in this life as Christians, you and I are gonna have opportunity after opportunity to pursue things and to do things that benefit us but might not be aligned with God's will and purpose for our life. I, I, I think it's really important to, to, to verbalize and to say that not every good opportunity is God's plan for your life. I, 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 I wanna I, I lay out a little bit of groundwork here. You see, it's, we're studying Galatians, and, uh, and, and what does that mean? Well, Galatians is literally a letter written by Paul, to the churches in Galatia. Galatians, the people of Galatia. Like, that would be like Paul writing a letter to New York, to the churches in New York, and it would be called like, like we're, we're New Yorkers. <laughs> like Galatians, you get it? Like they're from Galatia, they're the Galatians? You got it, okay. He's writing this letter to the Galatians. And you gotta understand that, that, that this region is a major metropolitan area that this region, it's in the ancient Turkey area. And, and, and Paul has been to this place before and he is writing to these churches and he is writing to people that he knows personally. Uh, it's kind of fun if you wanna kind of do a little bit of background, you can go and you can read Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14. And you can read out some of the things that happened. And in Acts chapter 13 and Acts chapter 14, you see what happened when Paul was in this area, when Paul was dealing with these people that he later wrote this book to. So after Paul's first missionary journey, Paul, uh, he was, he's an apostle, which means that he goes to different places and starts different churches. When Paul went to, on his first journey, he went to this area called Galatia. And when Paul was there, you can read about it in Acts chapter 13 and 14, he made all these relationships and he stirred all sorts of drama. Uh, all sorts of chaos ensued because of the conflict between Jews and Christians. And, and it's really fascinating. You should go read about it, but, but you should know something. This area was a major city and this major city had, had two things going for it. One, uh, it had a huge commerce, lots of wealthy people, lots of driven people, lots of entrepreneurial people. Reminds me of New York. And the second thing it had going for it is it had um, a, a belief system, a culture that, that worshiped what we now call the imperial cult. What does that mean? Well, the, most people in this region at, at, at this time who were not Jewish, they, they followed a cult, a, a, a false religion. And that false religion, uh, is, was this idea of, uh, of, again, we call it the imperial cult, which means that they literally worshiped the Roman government. They literally worshiped the goddess of Roma and they literally worshiped Caesar, their king. They worshiped him like a god. They believed he was a god. So the average person in their society had a completely wrong belief system and the average person in their society was seriously driven and busy like anyone is in a metropolitan city. I think it's perfect because in New York, I think we struggle with the same thing. We struggle with a, a society of people who are so driven, who are so focused on, on self-gratification, on self-success, on self-actualization, and we live in a culture that honestly is so anti-God, we are worshiping all the wrong things. So Paul, he's writing to this context. And in this context, Paul has to do something. He has to distinguish himself from the rest of the popular voices at the time. He has to be very intentional to say, I am Paul, an apostle, which means it's his way of saying, hey guys, I am a man of God. I am a Christian. I am not a magician. I am not a part of the imperial cult. What I am bringing you is countercultural. It is not like what other people are talking about. He has to distinguish that. He, he, he feels the need to say it. But also he feels the need to say to this driven society, 
to this um, career-focused group of people. He is so intentional on making sure that he's saying to them, hey, look, I'm a man of God. I'm not like this culture. But number two, I'm not here because of a good opportunity. I'm here because I believe God has sent me. And friend, I think that that is so huge for our lives today. When we look at our own lives, can we say the same thing? Are my motivations right? Am I driven by trying to focus on the opportunities before me? Or am I driven by being obedient to the thing that I believe God has called me to do? Sometimes they're one and the same. Oftentimes, though, you'll find that they aren't. Uh, Do you ever play hide and seek? Uh, my kids love playing hide and seek. And uh, it's a classic game. Kids go hide and then I go seek them. And sometimes they're really good at it. Sometimes I can find them. Sometimes I can't find them and I get nervous and I have to scream, okay, come out, you're freaking me out. Did you run away? You know. Um, I think sometimes for Christians, I feel like a lot of Christians, obedience and opportunity is like a game of hide and seek. I feel like a lot of Christians struggle with seeking, living a life of obedience and a life of stewardship where they're doing a good job at at taking hold of the opportunities before them. I feel like so much of us, it feels like in our life, I feel like for Christians, it feels like opportunity and obedience are elusive. (laughs) God, am I being obedient? God, will you send me more opportunity? If I'm being honest, I feel like every prayer I pray for people is either about obedience or opportunity. Pastor, would you pray that I get a job? Opportunity. God, Pastor, would you pray that I would uh, get free from sin? Obedience. Uh, so often I feel like that's, these are the two things we are praying for, but which one is your motivation? Paul is saying my motivation is my obedience to God. See, here's the reality. It, I believe that when Opportunity is is at the forefront of our mind as Christians. When opportunity is our motivation, I believe that obedience will be elusive in our rights. I, 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 I think that when we live seeking opportunity, you'll struggle to find obedience. But when you live seeking obedience, I believe you'll have opportunity seeking you. I wanna say that again. When you live seeking opportunity, you'll struggle finding obedience. But when you live finding obedience, you'll have opportunity seeking you. I have so many friends who are constantly, Pastor, would you pray that this door would open? Friend, what I want you to pray for is, God, will you help me be obedient to the thing you've called me to? When you are obedient to the thing God has placed before you, I promise you, he'll open doors that you don't even pray get open. Uh, Paul, he starts with this really simple thing. I am being obedient to God. I am sent not by a man, not by people. I'm not just pursuing my own gain. I'm not just here for my own notoriety. I am following a call of God on my life. When I read that, it really reads me. And I ask myself, God, am I like Paul? Am I making sure that what I am doing, am I motivated by the fact that I believe you have called me to do the thing before me? Friend, ask God that right now. That's what we're gonna do as we study Galatians. We're just gonna stop and we're just gonna ask, God, is this me? Do I seek obedience or do I seek opportunity? I know my motivations are right when I seek obedience and not opportunity because when I seek opportunity, Obedience will be hard to find, but when I seek obedience, opportunity will seek me. That's what I believe today. In fact, that, those aren't just my words. Those are the words of Jesus. You see, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 says, do not worry saying, what am I going to eat? Uh, what am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? He's worrying about material things. Uh, it, Jesus, in verse 32, he says, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Friends, God knows about the opportunities you need. God knows about the provision that you need. God knows about your bank account. He knows where it stands today, but he says this, seek first his kingdom 
and his righteousness and all this other stuff will be given to you as well. Seek first God, seek first obedience, seek first his will for your life and all the other things will automatically begin to follow in their, fall in place in your life. Seek first God's will and your will might come to pass. Your will, God's good blessings will fall into place for you. I think that's so good. Don't seek opportunity, seek obedience first. You seek obedience, not opportunity. So you know your motivations are right when you seek obedience and not opportunity. Now, that's just the beginning. This is just the opening sentence. I'm Paul, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Now, verse three, let's pick it up. He says this, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, most of us, it's just a throwaway sentence. Grace and peace to you from God. How many of you want grace and peace? I want grace and peace. This phrase is highly controversial and this phrase is highly inclusive. I love this about Paul. He, he, he's doing something here. He is colliding two cultures that are at odds in this book. You see, this word grace, it's charis. Uh, it, was, it was a part of a very common, uh, regularly used Greek Gentile um, introduction. It was very common for people to say greetings, charis. Uh, and, and, and Greeks, Gentiles, non-Jews, they would speak to each other this way. It was like saying, what's up? It's like saying, hello. It's just how they greeted one another. And Jews, they greeted each other a different way. They're, they greet each other using this word shalom, which means peace. And Paul, in his letter right here, he says, charis and shalom. He speaks two languages. He uses two greetings and he puts them together. He says, grace and peace to you. Charis, Greek Gentile greeting, shalom, Jewish, Greek, Jewish greeting, grace and peace to you from, from you, for, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a controversial thing because Paul is trying to write a letter to this metropolitan city with so much ethnic diversity and ethnic tension. And Paul says, grace and peace. He unites them in, in it right here, just really quick. He just simply puts it together, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's so beautiful. It, it really speaks to Paul's motivation in this letter. You see, Paul's motivations, they are right. You know your motivations are right when you seek obedience, not opportunity. But number two, you know your motivations are right when you love people at all costs. What are you driven by today? I, I gotta be honest, the, the more kids I have and the older I get, the easier it is for my motivations to be about me first, me and my family first, and people second. And, and in one regard, my family is my first calling. And that's true, that is the proper order. But there's a real temptation that each and every one of us face in this life to put ourselves in our families and those closest to us, first to a degree where we don't continue to love people who are different than us, who are outside of our friend groups, who disagree with us. And Paul is laying out his motivation right here in the, in the introduction. He is saying grace and peace to you, no matter the controversy, no matter what the other people think about me, no matter how crazy it might sound, he is combining, he is saying, I am gonna love all people. I'm gonna love people at all costs. You gotta understand the background of, of this letter. So Paul, he's writing this letter to this church in Galatia. It's after his first missionary journey. And he's writing this letter because there is a controversy happening in, this, in these churches that he started. And the controversy is, is over... Uh, Jewish law and the new Christian belief system. You see, what happened was Paul went there and he started the churches and, and they flourished and they grew. 
and, and he preached some really beautiful stuff. Uh, he preached the goodness of Jesus. And you can read about it in Acts chapter 13. He, he really gives an overview of the gospel in just a few verses. If you wanna know how to preach the gospel, just literally go read Acts chapter 13. And he gives this beautiful, summarized, entire story from, uh, from, from the Old Testament to, to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He just condenses it all right there. And, and when he does this, it causes a commotion. And I wanna show it to you. It's in Acts chapter 13, verse 45. It says that, uh, that, that Paul, he was teaching the good news of Jesus and, and, and he was differentiating the difference between living under the old covenant and the new covenant. He was talking about how our, our life and our salvation isn't found in our works, but it is found in what Jesus worked out on the cross for our sins. And, 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 he's, and he's sharing the difference between the two. And to be honest, what Paul was sharing, because it's the truth, because it was so life-giving, it drew a huge crowd. It reached a lot of people. And it says here in Acts chapter 13, verse 45, it says that when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. <laughs> this sounds like a lot of churches I know these days. You get like the new big church in town. I was like, oh God, don't go to that church. There's something must be wrong with it. Uh, probably not. Maybe they're just uh, filled with Jesus. Uh, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and they heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first, the Jews. Since you reject it and you do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. That's pretty divisive. Paul is in Galatia. In Acts chapter 13, he writes this letter to him after the fact. And he literally is saying to them, hey, I shared the good news with you first and you rejected it. Shalom, the people he's saying shalom to, the Jews. Now I'm gonna speak to the Greeks, to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. And he says, at all costs, no matter how much they don't like me, no matter what you think about me, I am going to love all people. Do you know what actually happens? If you keep reading in, the, in Acts chapter 13, it says that, the, the, that they begin to, that the Jews begin to stir up such a controversy that they begin to persecute Paul and Barnabas and they literally drive Paul and Barnabas out of the cities because of the controversy of Paul saying, you know what? We are gonna love people different than us. We are gonna preach the good news of Jesus to people who are different than us at all costs. I think that's beautiful. And Paul, right here in the introduction of his letter to the churches in Galatia, is reminding us of all the drama. And the drama of saying, hey, charis and shalom, grace and peace. This letter is for everybody. This good news, this gospel, this church, Jesus is for everybody. And Paul, he's laying out his motivation right out the gate. His motivation is to love people at all costs. I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful because there is a real temptation in our society and a real threat to, uh, there's a real threat in our culture uh, uh, to be canceled and to be discredited because we stand up for what we believe. Paul stands up for what he believes. And the people who had the power opposed him. And because those people had the most influence, they literally persecuted him and drove him out of the city. I think it's really, really fascinating because I think that that's the same thing that we face today. I think we all face a real temptation to not stand up for what we believe, to not stand up for the full gospel of Jesus Christ and to instead preach some other version of it, which we'll talk about next week, but instead to preach some other version of it simply because that will be more palpable to the culture around us. But Paul says, hey, look, I will love people at all costs. What's the cost? The cost is criticism from all the right people. <laughs> what well, I mean the right people, the people who we think matter them judging us, 
The people we think uh, have authority, them being against us. Paul is willing to lose his uh, credibility with the people who are right in his culture. He is willing to lose credibility. He's willing to lose face simply to say, I am including all people. Simply to stand up really for what he believes. Friends, what's your motivation today? Is your motivation opportunity or is it obedience? To be obedient to what God has called us to. What's your motivation today? Is it selfish? Is it self-centered? Or is it for all people at all costs? I love what Paul is saying. It's just so, it's so massive. You see, again, let's, let's scoot back and look at the drama unfolding. We're in Galatia and the imperial cult, people actually were required under the Roman law to worship Caesar as a god. It was the law. If you didn't do it, um, they would kill you. Now, what's interesting is that when the Romans, when they took over Israel and they came in and they established power over them, they, if you go and study the history, you, you'll see that the Romans, that they tried to force Israel to recant their faith in God and they, and they began to persecute Israel and then began to behead them and kill them and slaughter them, trying to get Israel to turn from their faith and to turn to this imperial cult. But honestly, the, what the Romans learned pretty quick is that these Jews, that these Israelites, that they were not gonna give up on their faith. These Israelites were not gonna cave in to the Romans. The Israelites were like, well, I guess you're just gonna kill us all because we're not gonna do it. So the Romans, because they're so pragmatic, and because the Romans are so bottom, bottom line, they just decided to make an exception. It's actually a historic fact that, the, the, that they made uh, this Jewish exception, that if you were a Jewish person, you had this, this um, freedom to not be a part of the imperial cult. It's actually a really fascinating thing that I think God made happen for the Israelites uh, over 2,000 years ago when they were going through this persecution. But here's the thing. If you were a Jew and you were a man, there was a physical sign that you were a Jew and you were a man. This physical sign was this, this act called circumcision. Now, the drama of this book really is over this topic of circumcision. Circumcision, for those of you who don't know, uh, I don't know how you don't know what circumcision is. You, you know, I'm not gonna explain it. You understand what circumcision is. That act uh, was something that the Jews believed they had to do in order to be a part of the old covenant. When Jesus came and he died for us, the circumcision wasn't an external circumcision, but Paul says it was an internal circumcision. God, he cuts away the sin from our life and we now are grafted into the family of God, not because of something we do externally, but because of a work Jesus does internally. So that's pretty straightforward. Because of Jesus, circumcision doesn't get you to heaven. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's not a big deal. Like We get that. Like No one's debating that, but they were. They were really debating it. You see, Paul, he goes to Galatia, and, 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 he, and he is, it, on his first journey, his first missionary journey, he builds the church, and we, I've said that up too many times now. We get that. But what happens next is he leaves. And when he leaves, there are these, these Jewish Christians who just can't let go of their idolatry to the law. What do I mean by that? There are these people who, because they grew up Jewish, and because they grew up under the Abrahamic covenant, and because they grew up under the law, they, and they believe in Jesus now, and they're a part of the church now. They simply can't let go. They're still kind of in bondage to this old theology. And they begin to start to teach and to preach to the people uh, in the region that, hey, you know what? Actually, yes, we need Jesus, but we need Jesus and we need circumcision. We need Jesus and we need works. We need Jesus, but like if you're really gonna be in, the, in, in God's family, you're gonna have to go the whole way. And they add these other qualifications. And that's really what the drama is here in this book, but you gotta understand why that's a big deal. Because the Jews, 
were exempt from imperial worship. The Jews were, you know that they were Jewish because of an external sign. This drama begins to kick up so much within the Jews and the Christians, even the Jewish Christians, so much that the Roman government begins to find itself in a, in a predicament of, hey, look, Christians aren't Jews. Are they allowed to worship Jesus? Christians aren't Jews, even though they might be Jewish. Is this, and this drama begins to ensue where the Roman government now gets involved in the drama of the early church and makes the decision that this new sect of Judaism, Christianity, is not Judaism because it doesn't have circumcision. And there's no way for these Christians to prove that they are the same way as that they pray to the same God and there's no external evidence. And this is actually what ignites the persecution and Christians lose the exemption and the, the rest is history. The rest is when you see the stories of the Colosseum and you see Christians being martyred for their faith. Honestly, you see all the chaos that ensues in thousands and thousands of Christians being killed for their faith. So much of it is literally because Jewish Christians couldn't accept people different than them. And they ratted other Christians out to the Roman government simply because they wouldn't get circumcised. And people were being killed for their faith. So Paul, his motivation is that he's gonna love people at all costs. He's gonna be obedient. He's not gonna seek opportunity. And the thing that he's preaching could literally get him killed, but he doesn't care. See, when, again, I, I read this and it reads me and I begin to ask myself, hey, am I that motivated by a love for Jesus, by a love for people, by a, a desire to be obedient? Am I so motivated by God that I would be willing to sacrifice everything? It's a hard question, but Paul was. And even today, Right now in the world, there are hundreds of thousands of Christians today who are being tortured and being killed. Every year, hundreds of thousands of Christians die because of their faith. It makes me ask, would I? Would I am I motivated by this right thing? You see, Paul, he understands something. And this is my third point today. He understands, well, he writes it right here in verse four. He says that Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. You see, he understands that if he's living for himself, if he's living trying to earn his salvation, if he's living for any other reason, he understands that he won't actually find salvation. You see, friends, your motivations are right when you seek obedience, not opportunity. Your motivations are right when you love people at all costs, and your motivations are right when you accept the fact that you can't rescue yourself. You see, Paul wasn't gonna try to save himself from the culture. Paul wasn't gonna try to rescue himself from his own sin. Paul wasn't gonna try to do any. We have to understand, friends, that our salvation is found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. You see, the division in the church at this time was, it was Jesus plus circumcision. That's what would get you saved. And that is still a real temptation in the church today. Honestly, some of us, we tithe, we serve, we, we remain abstinent, we, we don't sin because we believe that those things are, are actually earn us salvation. But friends, that's the same problem that these people were facing. It's not Jesus plus circumcision gets you salvation. It's not Jesus plus tithing, Jesus plus serving, Jesus plus good works, Jesus plus abstinence, Jesus, no. It's just Jesus. And it's because of Jesus 
that I begin to tithe. It's because I love Jesus that I serve. It's because I love Jesus that I do good works. It's because of Jesus that I abstain from sin. It's because of Jesus that motivates me, but it's not those actions don't save me. Jesus saves me. And friends, you and I, we have to accept a very simple fact that we can't rescue ourselves from this broken and fallen world. If you go back to Acts chapter 13, he says, therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. This is beautiful. I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification that you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. He's laying it out. He's calling their bluffs. He's saying, tell the Roman authorities, I don't care what you say. We, I am Jewish by ethnicity, but I am Christian by salvation. He's saying, I don't care if that means that you're gonna tell the Roman authorities and that's gonna get me killed. Let everyone know that nothing can save me except Jesus himself. His motivations were to be obedient to God. His motivation was to include and to love all people. His motivation was to accept the simple fact that we can't rescue ourselves. And I just think that today in 2021, I think we all have those same temptations. Paul, he just lays it out. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers and sisters with me to the church in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Paul lays out his motivations to be obedient, not to seek opportunity, to love people at all costs, even his own life, because he understands that he can't rescue himself. He can't earn enough money. He can't get enough notoriety. He can't do enough good stuff to find the comforts of this world or even to earn God's approval. No, Jesus did it all. Jesus is our motivations. My motivations are right when Jesus is my motivation to be obedient to him, to love all people, and to accept the fact that he died for my sins. Paul, he kind of lays out, that's kind of the whole book, and he just does it in five verses. And today, I think when we learn about Paul's motivations, it should challenge our motivations. So I wanna take a second and I wanna pray. And I wanna ask God to search my heart. Would you join me? Would you ask God to search your heart? Would you ask God to align your motivations with him? Just bow your head and close your eyes and say, God, will you search my heart? God, do I seek opportunity before I seek obedience? Ask him, do I seek money? Do I seek the next job? Do I seek the next city, the next apartment, the next relationship? Am I seeking opportunities that look good before I'm asking myself, God, is this opportunity, if I do it, is that obedient to you? God, I wanna be obedient to you. I don't just wanna be opportunistic. God, am I willing to love you at all costs? Am I willing to love others at all costs? Just ask them. Because when my motivations are self, self-focused, they are the wrong motivations. God will always open opportunities and doors to use you to serve others. It's always going to be that way. Ask God, say, God, do I try to earn my salvation? Am I working for salvation or am I working from it? Am I working for your love or am I working from it? God, am I following you the way you've called me to? Are my motivations right? Just ask him. God, I pray over each and every person now, God, that you would align our motivation with your heart because our motivations are what move us. Our motivation is what causes us to act and to think and to believe in this world. So Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to align our hearts and our thoughts and our minds and our actions with your will and your purpose in our life? We need you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen and amen. And hey, I wanna pray 
for some friends. Maybe you're here today and you're being honest. And you say, Pastor, you're talking about Jesus and how he died, on, he died for my sins to rescue me. Maybe today you realize that you need rescuing. You realize that you need Jesus. You realize, Pastor, I just can't keep going this way. Maybe today you find yourself in a moment where if you're being honest, you could say, Pastor, I haven't been living for Jesus. God hasn't been in control of my life. I've been in charge, not him. Is that you? Has Jesus been in charge or have you been in charge? It's a simple question. If Jesus hasn't been in charge, if you've been living for yourself, well, you can change all of that right now. If you wanna receive eternal life, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened. Jesus he offers us eternal life. He says, come. He says, I've come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The Bible says that God sent Jesus so that we can have eternal life in him. If you want that eternal life, if you want that abundant life, if you want rest for your soul, if you need rescuing today, you can simply accept the offer Jesus has for you. And the offer is simple. To give him lordship in your life. What does that mean? Make him your Lord and Savior. It means to say, Jesus, you're in charge now. I'm not. The Bible says if you confess that with your mouth, you say it out loud and you believe it in your heart that he died for your sins and rose again, it means that you're saved. And it means that, that your past sins are forgiven. And it means that you can begin to walk out God's purpose and will for you today. You can realign your motivations so you can start moving the direction God has for your life. If you wanna do that and make that commitment today, just pray a prayer, something like this, right? Where you're at, you can just bow your head and say, Jesus, I want you to be in charge of my life. God, I want my motivations to be aligned with the direction you want me to move. God, I wanna live for you. Just tell him that, I wanna live for you. Ask him to forgive you. Say, God, will you forgive me? Would you forgive me for my sins? Would you forgive me for living for myself? Lord, would you help me follow you? Tell him this, say, God, I believe in you. God, help me love you, help me serve you. Just tell him this, say, I'm yours, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, if you prayed a prayer like that right now, the Bible says that you're a new creation, that you are saved, that today is, there is a party in heaven. You are grafted in, you are welcome into the family of God. Jesus loves you. And man, I'm so thankful that you've made that decision. Man, we love you so much. Uh, church, I'm so thankful for this week. I can't wait to keep studying God's word. I'd encourage you to start reading through the book of Galatians. Friends, when our motivations are right, we start moving in the right direction. And I believe that God is gonna bless us as we begin to study and as we begin to live out what his word has for us. Church, I love you so much. I'll see you next week.